In this video, I'm going over prospect theory, and prospect theory really is just a shape of a utility function. Economists have known for many years that in the positive quadrant, utility functions have diminishing marginal utility, and all prospect theory really does is it adds the shape of the utility function as people generally behave in the negative quadrant in this third quadrant down here. And there's really three key features of prospect theory that I'm going to be talking about. One is the idea of loss aversion, the fact that people um, hate losses more than they love gains. And then the second is the fact that prospect theory needs an origin of some sort, so how do you define that origin? And oftentimes it's what you already have, but it can also be expectation. So we'll talk about how do we think about what is at the origin with prospect theory. And then the third feature of prospect theory has to do with risk aversion and risk-seeking behavior. Um, in particular, we have this risk-averse positive quadrant that's been, um, that's been part of the economic theory for many, many years. We've known that people tend to behave in a risk-averse way. Um, but when we move into the negative quadrant, of course, the curvature changes from concave to convex in this negative quadrant, in this third quadrant, in which case we get more risk-seeking behavior in this quadrant. So we're going to talk about what those three things mean and give some examples. All right, so those are the three things, and I should mention um, on this axis, oftentimes you have money, but really it's anything. This could be um, uh, number of houses you own, number of ice cream cones, and this is just the y-axis, of course, is just your utility over those things. And um, it's an empirical fact that people tend to be loss averse. Um, that is, that if you lose $20 in a day, that's going to really negatively affect how you feel. Um, you're upset at it, it might kind of ruin the rest of your day, it might last a while. Whereas if you find $20 unexpectedly, you'll be happy when you find it, but it's not going to have that lasting effect on your emotions. And uh, loss aversion, the fact that people uh, hate losses more than they love gains, needs to be built into the way that we construct our utility functions. Now, um, we've proven prospect theory in a number of different settings. The classic setup is for professors to put a mug or a pen at their students' seats. So if students have assigned seats, you might imagine a hundred students in a lecture hall. They have assigned seats, they show up, and randomly either they get a mug or a pen. And both of these things are worth about five dollars. The pen is pretty fancy, it's not just a, a classic ballpoint pen, it has a little bit of pizzazz to it. And the students get to hold on to those all, all hour. The professor says, those are yours to keep and take home. So the students handle them. They come to sort of um, adjust their expectations that this pen is theirs or this mug is theirs. And then at the end of the hour, right after class is over and right before they go away, they're given the option that they can swap with someone else. Um, and there's different variations on this. Some, in some variations, they just ask, would you prefer to swap for the other one? Would you prefer to keep what you've got or swap for the other one? And in other versions, they're asked, how much would you sell that thing for? Would you sell it for the $5 it's actually worth? Would you sell it for $4? And then how much would you pay to buy the other thing that you didn't get? A pen if you got a mug, a mug if you got a pen. And um, in both variations, we find that people don't want to trade. If you got a pen in the beginning, you don't want to give that up for a mug, and vice versa. If you got a mug, you don't want to trade it for a pen. Now, it's highly unlikely that when the professor randomly distributed these products at the beginning of the hour, that the mug people hap the mug lovers happen to get the mugs and the pen lovers happen to get the pens. That's highly unlikely. More likely, the fact that you own something increases your value for it, or once you, or else, in fact, that's how you, you connect this with prospect theory, um, once you've held on to that thing for an hour, you've touched it, you believe it's yours, um, you've changed your expectations that you're going to be leaving with this mug or with this pen, that's going to set you at this origin. So to lose that mug or pen um, through some kind of auction or some kind of uh, arranged trade that the professor has, that loss would cost you much more in your utility loss than the gain of the other thing that you never th ever thought you would have. So um, 
yeah, obviously with the, the version of this thing that you put a price on it, you put a much higher price on what you would sell this thing for that you've had all hour than you do on the thing that you could buy from your, the, the student sitting next to you. So that's the classic setup for um, testing prospect theory or testing loss aversion in the classroom. And it goes along really well with this graph. Um, but there's lots of other settings where we've seen this at play. In fact, it's, but the concept's been around for a while now and we've verified it in many settings that this kind of shape of utility function does a good job of characterizing the way people um, behave and their emotional relationship with things. Um, for example, people won't sell houses for a lower price than they bought the house for, even if otherwise it would be rational to do so. There's lots of setups uh, that will tell you this is, this is actually matching people's emotions. Now, the second piece of this equation is what's at the origin? And um, when you're talking about the mug pen situation, what's at the origin is what you have, what you believe you will go away from the classroom with, but this can also just be your expectation. So I find that students have a pretty intuitive sense of this. For example, when you take an exam, you leave the exam telling yourself, I failed that exam, I did horribly, I did worse on that exam than any other exam before, and you really try to um, convince yourself that you did horribly on the exam. And why, st why do students do that? It's because once you get the exam back, if your grade is lower, than you expected, you're going to experience loss aversion. It's going to be a really bad experience. Whereas if you experience, um, if you get a better grade than you expected, it'll be a positive experience. So you know that if you can adjust your expectations about how you did on the exam to hopefully lower than you really believe you got, if you can successfully psych yourself out in that way, then you're much more likely to have a good experience as opposed to a bad experience when you get that exam back. And this shows up in other places. Christmas Vacation, of course, is about a guy who thinks he's going to get a Christmas bonus because he's gotten this surprise bonus at the end of every year in the past that he's worked for this company. And when that bonus doesn't come through, he's really, really upset. In fact, he goes on a rant and uh, his brother-in-law goes and kidnaps his boss, but that's the movie portion of that. Uh, really, it's because he's it's not that it's set in stone that he will get a bonus. This is supposed to be a surprise thing for the employees at every at the end of every year. But um, if it's happened often enough in the past that he expects this bonus, then anything below the bonus is going to um, lead to his experience of loss aversion. He's making lower than he expected. Um, and of course, he's not making negative dollar amounts. He's not making a negative salary for the year, he's just getting lower than expected. Which indicates that whatever this origin point is, is actually going to be really important. And a lot of marketers, for example, will take advantage of this by trying to manipulate your expectation. So that if you don't get the product that they're trying to sell, they want you to experience that as a loss of some sort, because you've pictured it in your head enough, um, you've decided that it's something you want in the future, and once you've set that expectation for yourself that you might have this product in the future, not getting that product is going to put you in the loss aversion realm, which makes it much more likely that they'll sell the product to you because you don't want to experience that loss. So the manipulation of expectations is actually a key part of the story here, and it adds a complexity because this expectation is purely psychological. Um, so it can be manipulated by marketers and by yourself and by people in your life who are trying to manipulate that either for good or for, for their own benefit. Um, so that's the second part of prospect theory. Now the third part, um, if you've uh, done some research on the shapes of these graphs and loss, loss aversion and loss seeking behavior. Uh, you should already be able to see that the concave shape is associated with risk aversion and the convex shape is associated with risk seeking behavior. And there's lots of experiments that, uh, that model this and that show that this is actually how people feel 
All right, so one of the classic ways of testing the risk aversion, risk-seeking nature of this is by giving people these options. So the first option is I can give you a piece of paper that guarantees you if I flip heads when I flip a coin, you win $100. If I flip tails, you win zero. So that's one option. You can take that piece of paper or you can get $50 right now for sure. And of course, what do people choose? We know that um, you can do this on many, many people and the vast majority of them are going to choose the $50 for sure. Um, even though the expected value of those two things is the same, people choose to avoid the risk. So in the positive realm, and of course that's the positive realm because we're talking about um, between zero and a hundred dollars, so it's, it, everything's positive in that example. People choose to avoid the risk and they go for the sure bet, and that's consistent. But if you give the flip version of that, it, it changes people's answers, and instead of going for the sure bet, they go for the risk. So in this case, um, there's a piece of paper that says you have to have this risk. So if I flip heads, you lose a hundred dollars. If I flip tails, you lose nothing. You can either keep that risk that's been placed on you, or you can lose $50 for sure. And which of those two things do people choose? Which would you choose? Most people in that case are going to take the risk. They'll say, um, I'd rather have the 50% chance that, that it's tails and I won't lose anything than pay $50 for sure to avoid the risk. So um, you can probably see in your own heart that you are risk averse in the positive realm in the first quadrant and risk seeking in the third quadrant. That is a natural behavior. And there's lots of ways that this is applied, lots of scenarios that um, where, where this is applicable. One interesting application is when people feel like they're behind. So let's say they, they can never quite make their bills or um, they always feel behind their neighbor neighbors. Sometimes they may feel like they're in this quadrant, in which case that could help to explain why we sometimes see a more risk-seeking behavior among very low-income people is that they already feel like they're constantly behind, like they're in this third quadrant naturally and they're trying to get back to zero, and when people are trying to get back to zero, they will take risks that they wouldn't take if they felt like they were in the positive quadrant. So there's a lot of places where prospect theory comes up. It's a super powerful um, concept, and really the only thing it is, is the shape of a utility function. That's it. It's this small um, change in the shape where there is actually a kink, which is a little bit weird, and there's this expectation point, which is psychological, so it's a little bit weirder than just classic um, diminishing marginal utility, but it's not that much weirder. It's just a shape of a graph, but there's so much real-world intuition about how people behave and how people feel about things built into this one graph.